there, American Farmsteaders. This is Donna with Hazel Bell Farm. And Jenny with the Gramstead Family Farm. And we are coming to you from Northeast Florida as two American Farmsteaders doing our best to grow our own food and share our experiences with you in hopes that you will grow a little food of your own. And today we are excited to have Emily with us from Bridge Acres Farm. Um, say hey, Emily. Hey, everybody. <laughs> Emily has actually um, been on with us before. Yep. She did a um, goat episode with us. Um, when was that? It's been a few months ago. So yeah. go back and look for Keeping Homestead Goats Part 1. Yes. And so we wanted to have her back on for a Part 2 to get a little bit more on the dairy side um, to yeah. give y'all some more info on that. So Yeah, for the homesteader. That's right. Yeah. So if you go back and listen to that, she talks a little bit about breeds and just some very basic overall uh, things that goats need. But we want to talk more about, um, you know, talking to the homesteader more, not necessarily um, the breeder or the shower, um, but the homesteader and like, what are, what are they looking for? What are they, uh, why would they want to keep goats in the first place? Um, that kind of thing. So where sh- shall we start? Yeah, well, you know what? I saw a really funny meme this morning, and I screenshot it. So I'm going to pull out my phone real quick because I thought it was hilarious because I wanted to share it with you guys, and I should have been more prepared, but hey, I'm not. So (laughs) That's how we roll. That's how we roll sometimes. (laughs) But it just made me giggle when I saw it. It says, I don't want to adult anymore. I don't even want to human. I just want to goat, jump around randomly, eat what I want, and headbutt anybody who annoys me. Yeah, that's pretty accurate. That sounds like goats. <laughs> so tell us, Emily, why would somebody want to keep that around? <laughs> I think it depends on your personality and what you want. You know, a lot of people want a dairy animal but don't live on in a place where they can have something like a cow or they have dietary restrictions and they do better on goat smoke. There's a lot of people that are finding it's a lot easier for them to digest goat dairy because the molecules are so much smaller. Right. Um, it still contains lactose. It's still, you know, it's not a lactose free milk that a lot of people think it is. Um, it, but it's much easier to digest for some people. Right. Right. They're, you know, I do enjoy their personalities. Yeah. They are <laughs> fun and they are cute. Yeah. Yeah. They are. They, they just, they seem <laughs> They seem to just cause trouble. I feel like there's a lot of issues that can be avoided by good planning and good infrastructure. And a lot of people don't do either of those before getting the goats. They yeah. learn the hard way. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I, I mean, infrastructure, I feel like we always kind of go back to that. Infrastructure is just so important on a farm to like make it run smoothly and run well. And it really, really helps if you just put a little bit of extra effort and forethought into how you're setting things up. Yes. Like I'm really trying to rack my brain right now about how I want to get set up for this dairy cow. You know, because she's just with all my beef cows right now and like, "Mm, how do I want to do this? So, um, and goats are kind of the same way. Very much so, yeah. Especially, I guess, if you're milking a couple of them and you have like a whole herd of goats, like moving everybody around and getting everybody where they need to be. Separating bucks or weaning babies. And it can be hard to wait because you get excited and you want to bring them there and, you know, you talk to the breeders and you want to bring home the baby goat right then. But it's really best if you can find a couple of breeders, you know, in your area that, that you, were, you know, can trust yeah. and see their setups and see how it works. Um, it's, you know, the same thing with the dairy cow. Before I brought my dairy cows home, you know, I watched Donna do all her trial and error and, you know, just kind of learn <laughs> from her issues. Learn from Donna's mistakes. <laughs> well, that's how it, you know, well, you Yeah, you're everybody. right. It you didn't help. have a cow mentor. No, yeah. I didn't have a cow mentor at all. Anybody I had was um, purely online um, and, and even goats, like before I had any goats for dairy for milking, we had goats that were purely for fun. Like our kids just wanted goats to have to jump around. Eric liked having them to clear some woods, um, you know, that kind of thing. They just were for fun and they kitted and, um, we had some good experience, some not so good experience, but overall, like we didn't do much with them. And so when it came time, like, okay, now we're going to have dairy goats, even though I had dairy cows, I was like, Emily, (laughs) now you're my goat mentor because I don't know what I'm doing here. And I, you know, just wanted to give them the best care. 
Um, one of the things that um, people say a lot, and I've heard you say a lot is, as far as infrastructure goes, is make sure you have good fencing. So yes. what does that mean? When you say make sure you have good fencing, like talk to us about like height or you know, durability, sturdiness. Like That's the biggest issue. I, a lot of the things that I see people use is they try to do it cheaply. You cannot do it cheaply and do mm-hmm. it well. It's just those two things are mutually exclusive when it comes to mm. building fences. You need to either know what you're doing or hire someone who does to build a fence because people don't stretch the fence. They want to use welded wire because it's so much cheaper. Well, that's going to break in like six months. Oh, yeah. They, <laughs> goats like to rub on fences, and if you get the welded wire, the welds rust so fast, they're just going to pop, and then the goats are going to walk through the fence. And they stand. Like, they, they like to yes, climb them. They Because yeah. they want to reach for leaves, or if you're on the other side, they want to stand on the fence and talk to you. And if it's that welded wire, it's not going to last. Mm. The always, always, always go for woven wire. And doing something that's, you know, like the 4 by 4 sheep and goat fence, that really is a good quality fence. It's worked really well for us. Um, a lot of people swear that you need the two by four. We haven't really needed that, um, mm-hmm. with ours as long as it's stretched well, you know, you need those corner posts sunk so that you can stretch it really tight. Cause mm-hmm. if it's loose, it's going to sag and they're going to escape. <laughs> um, <laughs> they're going to escape. <laughs> they're going to escape. Field fencing <clears throat> can work if it's stretched really tight, but it's not nearly as stable because you know, it, the squares get so much bigger and the, the baby goats can fit through that, but Mm-hmm. The four by four works really well. Two by four works great, but it's astronomically expensive. I was say it's pricier. It's isn't so it? expensive. Okay. So, like electric fencing would be a no no for your goats. Electro, <clears throat> excuse me. Electro netting can work. Okay. You have to kind of train them along, you know, train them to the electric fence. But a lot of people use that inside their regular fencing right. so that they can rotate, they can rotationally graze, which helps prevent parasites. Um, but electric strands will not work. No, no. no. Goats will go right through them <laughs> without hesitation. Won't affect them at all. Okay. Yeah. The, yeah I, and I believe <laughs> that because, and I see people do this online a lot, like people that have bigger, um, flocks of sheep. Mm-hmm. They're using just like a couple of strands of electric wire. And I don't know how they're making it work because my sheep, they just blow right through that electric wire. It, mm-hmm. it makes no sense to me that it would ever work. Yeah. I mean, they would literally just have to touch it with their nose. If they touch it anywhere else on themselves, they're just not even going to feel it. Right. They're insulated. <laughs> they're insulated. And the goats aren't insulated. They just don't care. They don't right. care. They're, yeah. just, they're just headstrong. They yeah. know that once they get through it, they're going to be fine. Worth they're, it. Yeah. yeah. It's worth it. Exactly. Yeah. It's, exactly. It's, it's like the kid it. that's trying to decide if it's worth the spanking. You know what I mean? Like, right, right. It's like my great preenies. You know? Yeah. It like, doesn't matter. It's worth it. It's worth it. They're bad. <laughs> So that, you know, the cattle panels can get a little pricey, but those tend to work really well for larger breed goats and for bucks. They're yeah. a good height. They're really sturdy. They're easy to put up. They're easy to take down if you want to move them around instead of having permanent fencing. We've had really, really good luck with using cattle panels. Yeah. Um, you know, now they're $36 a piece. But I know. They keep yeah. on getting pricier and pricier, but it is it is good fencing. You'll never need to replace them. Mm-hmm. Is that something? Could you make like a rotational grazing cage out of cattle panels yes. and, and move a couple, like a, maybe three goats within, you know, if you You had- could even do more than that. You know, when we were trying to decide where we wanted our barn and how we wanted our new property set up, because there was no fencing, there was no infrastructure at all there. That's what we did. We, we used... Cattle panels, I think we used six. And then we had, you know, the Nigerian dwarf bucks. So they're a little smaller. You can fit more into a pen. But we moved them, you know, every three days. They cleared the land. They didn't have parasites. It, it actually worked really well. They can, nice. They can get a little heavy. You know, you kind of have to plan ahead and figure out how you're going to set it up. We used T-posts and our property is sugar sand. So it's pretty easy to pretty pull them easy. out. Pretty easy, yeah. Yeah. Um, and you have to be a little strong to move those. You know, it's not quite as portable as electro netting would be, but it's a lot sturdier and yeah. a lot more foolproof. You know, you can yeah. hook them up to tree. We had them like tied with hay bale twine to trees at certain <laughs> points and it worked <laughs> it fine. Worked. Yeah. It worked. That's funny. Um, Temporarily. <laughs> yeah. And for a portable fence, it worked really well. Um, we built their shelters out of cattle panels, you know, made little hoop houses that looked like Quonset huts and put a tarp over them. Those yeah. things lasted through hurricanes. They are the most portable 
it, it works super well. You know, you can build a That's thing. That's awesome. You can fit probably 10 Nigerians into three panels, you know, bent over to make that little Quonset hut thing. And it's totally portable. We did that for the first two years that we lived on the property until we built the barn. And if you're wanting to rotate pastures, that's a really good way to do it. Because, yeah, that's a movable structure. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. I mean, I wonder if you could even like, and it might get a little heavy, but if, you know, you're only moving it every couple of days, but like frame out the bottom of it and put some like big wheels on it. Or and skids. just pull it like, mm -hmm. yeah, oh, skids, right, like right. a chicken tractor yeah. or something. You could absolutely do that and pull it behind a tractor, pull it behind a right. lawnmower or a four-wheeler. Or just, you know, right. shoulder it and pull it behind <laughs> you. That's what we did. <laughs> yeah. I love structures that can move around and, you know, things that you can change up. Because I know that's been, we do that all the time. It's like, okay, we'll do it this way for a little while. And, okay, that's not working anymore, so let's switch it up. Right. Mm -hmm. You get the flexibility and it really makes a big difference. Yeah. Um, you know, that's going to be an investment. But it's well worth it's the investment. Worth it. Yeah, do not do fencing poorly because you will want to tear your hair out. And yes, and it, you'll just be redoing it. You're spending extra time to redo everything and then extra money to redo exactly. everything. Exactly, you're going to spend right. way more doing it poorly mm -hmm. than you will doing it correctly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've done some poor fencing and regretted <laughs> it. <laughs> <laughs> it's always a learning curve, but uh, that's one of the, I think the biggest uh, issue people have is that they don't do fencing right. Yeah. Okay, so let's move on. So um, you talked about, you touched on shelter there. So, and you talked about that in our part one also, that um, they they need a place to get out of the rain. Yeah. Um, they need a well-ventilated space. They need to get up off the ground. But and other it, than that. As like, long as they're not in mud. You know, like they can be on the ground, but they right. do prefer sleeping off the ground. Okay, okay. Um, well-ventilated is one of the massive issues I see too. People want to lock them up to keep them safe from predators and then moisture builds up and they get pneumonia. And it's... Mm. It, Entirely preventable, you know, in that respect. You know, they can get other respiratory issues, but that one is very preventable, just making sure it's well ventilated. And closed off on three sides, you can get away with two-sided if it's longer, like the little Quonset hut, you know, hoop houses. But right. three-sided, you know, you want it, them to be able to get out of the wind, out of the rain. They do not like getting wet. <laughs> like, they act like they're going to melt. They do. Like three raindrops <laughs> fell. <laughs> There run, go the goats. Run for cover. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Um, what about diet? So, like, you know, there's that myth that goats will eat absolutely anything. Um, you know, the old cartoons that the billy goats eat in the um, tin cans and that kind of funny thing. Um, so it's been my experience that that is absolutely not true. That <laughs> they, I had picky goats. Um, we had goats that did a really good job clearing brush, and they would eat anything. I mean, not like stuff, but... I mean, I honestly have a cow who will eat anything we leave out. So <laughs> They're not nearly as bad as cows about eating stuff they shouldn't. Okay they're, okay. they're way more careful about that. You know, they will strip wiring, but a lot of times that's because they want the copper wire. They're copper deficient. Ah. Really? Yes. That's interesting. And so having good loose minerals out, you know, I use a cow mineral because Florida is deficient in everything and yeah, that's they so can funny. you know they that's need the selenium because they'll get white muscle disease they need mm -hmm. the copper which makes them more parasite resistant and they need it for immune function um you know sheep can't have all the extra copper most of the time you know there are exceptions yeah. obviously but yeah. um they having a good quality loose mineral available to the goats is extremely important that's the first thing that i tell people about feeding cows too minerals yeah. first minerals minerals, yeah. minerals first that's super important and a lot of people We'll get, you know, the ones at Tractor Supply because that's what's available. My goats would rather die than eat that. They do not like it My for whatever reason. I don't know what the formula is. They will not eat it. They will eat stuff like Sweet Licks Meat Maker. That's a goat-specific mineral. We use Vitafirm Conceptade, the cow mineral, at our farm, and that works really, really well. We don't have parasite issues because, you know, mm -hmm. of the way we keep the goats, but those minerals are vitally important for parasite control. Um, and then hay, we do leave hay free, out free choice. Um, goats are going to do a lot better on wooded property than pasture. They browse, will, they right. like browse. They will graze, but they don't really, they can't sustain themselves on just grazing. They, they do a lot better on browse. So our property is wooded. They do amazing on that because mm -hmm. they'll just go out in the woods and eat pine bark off the trees. And they like brush. that roughage. They want, mm -hmm. yeah, they want the roughage and it's 
stops them from getting parasites because they're not eating on the ground. You know, if they're mm-hmm. grazing, they're picking up yeah. worm eggs, they're picking up coccidia. They just do a lot better on wooded lots than they do pastures. Interesting. So opposite from cows in that respect. If you have a right, heavily wooded right. property. Cows are good. Yeah, they're better grazers. They right. will browse if right. they have to, but they much prefer to graze. And goats are the opposite. They will graze if they don't have any other option, but they much prefer the browse. Mm. So, you know, that could that, help make your decision as right. far as what dairy animal you want. If you are if you live on, you know, sloping property that's totally wooded, the goats are going to do a lot better on that without you having to change your the entire base layer of your farm Mm -hmm. right or put out a bunch of money on feed right you're still gonna do that there's no getting around (laughs) i think just livestock in general teach me how to not do that oh my gosh (laughs) if you're if you're looking for an animal that can be solely grass-fed and you know do milk on just grass and no grain then you're probably looking at specific genetics in dairy cows you're not going to find that in a goat right goats Mm -hmm are going to need a little bit of hay. They're going to need grain to sustain their body condition. They do better on, you know, grain than they do grain-free. That was my next question. Is there such a thing as just a browse-fed dairy goat that produces well? No. No? Okay. Yeah. (laughs) I'm sure people would argue that with me. Right. The ones that I've seen where people are trying to do that do not look very good. They they are not as healthy, you know. Mm. They just don't – they are not going to produce as much. They need the calories – they, if you're looking for scrub goats, you know, to process for meat, you could probably get away with that. But if you want a dairy animal and you are trying to, you know, have milk for your family, they're not going to produce on just browse without, okay. you know, additional supplementation of stuff. So, like, what kind of stuff? <laughs> like, what kind of grain do you feed then? I feed a mix because, you know... I have a bunch of different life stages, and so everybody kind of gets something different, and I overcomplicate things. But uh, having, that could be fun. Having a basic goat grain mix. Like already blended for goats. Yes, blended okay. for goats is a great place to start. There's, you know, you can fiddle with the different brands and all that stuff. Some goats like one brand more than others, but having a goat specific grain that's balanced in calcium and phosphorus is where you should start before you start fiddling with anything extra. The calcium and phosphorus ratio is really important if you have male goats because if there's too much phosphorus, that's when they get the urinary stones, the urinary calculi. Right. And people think that it's from feeding alfalfa or feeding too much grain. And too much grain can cause it because of the phosphorus imbalance. But if you're feeding a balanced grain, you're really not going to run into the issues that you see with people having these where they're on high corn diets, you know, or, or a feed that's not balanced. Like the feed from our local feed mill is not balanced. And if you feed that to male goats, they could, you know, they, it could cause some serious issues. Hmm. Um, it's labeled for goats, but it's not balanced in the calcium and phosphorus. So not everybody who's formulating these goat feeds knows what they're doing in that respect. Right. It would be Well, and there's there like you said there's so many like life stages. If you're if you're feeding lactating goats, you're probably feeding them differently than dry goats versus male goats or young goats versus old lady goats. You right. Know? Absolutely. And you know, if they're dry and you have a lot of brows, they will probably be fine on that. Mm-hmm. If they're not, you know, they're not lactating, they're not putting out that extra um, energy, then a lot of them will do fine on that. The My dry does, they get coastal hay and browse, and then they'll get like a handful of feed in the mornings just to keep them in the routine. Mm. Um, kids get a lot more grain and a lot more hay because I want them to grow. I want them to have that, you know, good growth. I don't want them to be stunted. Bucks are very easy to keep. They can exist on browse <laughs> and air. Like, and air. <laughs> they, they do much better without a ton of extra stuff just, you know, with the balance of grain and everything. They they get minerals. My bucks have access to coastal hay and a balanced goat grain once a day. But they stay fat, like real fat. <laughs> That's funny. That's how my rams are. Mm-hmm. They, I mean, I don't really give them – I mean, they're getting nothing right now from me. Mm-hmm. Nothing. <laughs> they are great. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, we do have a lot of pasture grass, so. Yeah, and that um, sheep are grazers. Yeah. So there's another, you know, people – 
could look into dairy sheep if they don't have room for a cow, but they have grass or they don't think they could handle a cow because cows can be, you know, a lot stronger and more to deal with. Yeah, right. Um, There are dairy sheep. There's breeds of dairy sheep. Yeah, I've considered that myself. (laughs) I mean, not like I'd ever (laughs) consider getting rid of my dairy cows, but that could be fun, dairy sheep. could be fun. So... How much milk are you getting from like, and I know it's going to vary with breeds and particular does, but on average, like how much milk are you getting from your goats? So I have American Sonnens and Nigerian Dwarfs. Okay. And from the, I have culled for milk production. Yeah. But on the same token, I want them to maintain body condition and me not have to throw you know, $50 bales of alfalfa at them every single day for them to produce. So mine are, you know, more moderate producing than some people in the nation, but I want them to be able to survive in Florida and me not have to sell a kidney to pay, to feed them. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, So I am for the Nigerians. I typically get, you know, between three and five pounds. I have a couple that will produce up to six pounds. So a pound is two cups. Okay. Roughly. Okay. With, when measuring, we typically weigh it, especially when we're doing milk tests. So I have to like try and convert it in my right. head to how much right. it is. So eight, eight cups is a half gallon. Yes. And so that would be. Well, that was fast. That was, <laughs> I've been making a lot of cheese. I'm impressed. <laughs> I've been making a lot of eight cheese lately. Eight cups would be four pounds. To, okay. Roughly. Okay. So a half gallon. That's, that's about like That's respectable. Milk. It's like eight. I think it's use, average is it's eight, eight point six right. pounds. Or, um, yeah. That's just a rough estimate. Mm-hmm. The. And for a 60 pound goat to produce, you know, a half gallon or more a day is pretty good, especially if they're getting coastal and browse That's predominantly. A small animal to produce that, that much pound volume. Pound for pound, they make more than the cows do. Right, right. They really do as far as like body ratio. weight ratio yeah. and yeah. Like what they're, what feed you're putting into them versus what you're getting out. They really, percentage wise, do make more milk mm-hmm. for their body size. My Sonnen is a first freshener. She's a two year old. So her She's going to increase next year. She's still giving me a gallon a day on mostly browse nice. and coastal grain. Wow. But coastal and grain. And she's like the size of a large dog. Yeah. Yeah. She weighs, I think when I weighed her, she was like 150 pounds. She's, she maintains she her body like a condition. a small white deer. That's, <laughs> that's the best I could say. Like a small deer. Large dog, small deer. <laughs> the, I really do like the Sonnen milk too. A lot of people complain about goat milk flavor because they've only ever had the goat milk from the store. Yeah. Um, it's completely different it's when you funky. have it yourself. Yeah. yeah. And people who are milking their goats, if they don't like the way it smells or tastes, it's usually a mineral imbalance. It goes right back to the minerals. What you're feeding them does matter. You know, alfalfa will make it sweeter. Um, beet pulp will make it sweeter because of that. It increases the butter fat in the milk, that fiber. Mm. increases the butter fat but if they are deficient in zinc or copper or something like that cobalt it's going to make their milk taste funky Mm -hmm. that's a really good indication that your mineral is not where it needs to be do you ever um so with cows there's this whole idea of not buying a premixed mineral um for your loose mineral that you put out like a buffet of minerals where they have like different trays right. of here's different the zinc choices. and here's the cobalt and here's the copper and you know and the cows um the the theory is that the cows know what they need the you know, they, they will eat what they want. What they I need. essentially do, do that with the goats. Is that what I you do, do use a mix. I use the Vitafirm mix. And then I also leave out salt because especially mm-hmm. in the summer, their yeah. need for salt increases. And I don't want to risk them overdosing on minerals because they're trying to get that get the salt. salt. So I have loose salt. I use Redmond salt. Um, leave that out for your choice. I have a selenium vitamin E powder that I get from an organic mm-hmm. per, uh, supplier. And it's made to mix in with the feed, but I've been leaving it out free choice for like six years now. Nobody has overdosed on it. You know, people tell me all the time I'm going to croak off my goats because I do this buffet thing and it hasn't happened yet. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I mean, they're, they're pretty smart that way. I leave out zinc free choice. You know, I use Zimpro 40 and a lot of people recommend, that's the only one I've seen that they recommend you top dress with, you know, add a little bit to their feed every day. And I've not seen that cause any issues. I would never recommend anyone top dress selenium or... Mm mixed minerals with the feed because you can't then the goats can have no say in what they're taking in and what they need and you can overdose them easily on you know copper toxicity i've seen a couple of Mm -hmm. people lately post about their goats dying from copper toxicity well they were most of them were top dressing the feed Mm. um not all of them but there was enough of it happening where i was like 
okay, let's let them choose what they want. Right, right. I They're leave out zinc, and then once a week I will give them kelp because otherwise they would just eat a 50-pound bag in 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> they must so really they want get, that one. Yeah, they get kelp once a week, and then I do the Diamond V yeast as well, and that's a good cobalt supplement, and that really impl- improves the flavor of their milk. It, you know, I noticed an immediate difference when I started doing the yeast. Their milk got sweeter. It was a very – it tastes like – Taste testing wise, you almost can't tell the difference between that and the cow milk. Mm. I can taste the fact that the cow milk came from a cow, but it's, you know, and the, the goat milk didn't, but it's very, very mild flavored. Even the sonnet, you know, they, people say that Nigerian milk is the best. It's the creamiest and it is the creamiest, but I actually prefer drinking. If I'm going to drink milk, drinking the sonnet milk, cause it's not quite as thick. Right. Mm. It's easier to drink for yeah. me. Yeah. That makes sense. It does make sense. Um, So breed plays a part in flavor, not just diet. Yes, but diet and mineral supplementation plays the biggest role, in my opinion. Okay. The milk handling plays a huge role in the flavor. If you are not being sanitary, it's going to taste funky because you got bacteria in it. Right. Yeah. (laughs) You know, I am OCD about sanitizing my milk machine in the lines or if I'm hand milking, really making sure that udder is clean and that my hands are clean and that the bucket is clean and, you know... Right. Yeah. So let's talk about that. Like, what is your setup for milking goats? Are you milking like in a stanchion? Yes. Are they like, are you moving them from like one paddock into like the milking area? Like walk us through your daily milking. I have a shed because we're still very much in the phase of, oh, look, we got a good deal on this. So we're going to make it work. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Building the homestead. Right. We're building the homestead on a budget. Yeah. You know, there's there's no like magical supply of money in the background over here. (laughs) So we found, you know, a friend found this shed for me at a chicken farm that was closing and I just had to pay to move it. Okay. And so we paid a company $600 and they moved it. It was already insulated. We slapped a window unit in there. I've got half of it as my feed room and half of it as the milk room. Nice. Um, so I have my fridge out there. We put in a sink and it's pretty awesome. It's what inspired me that I need to do the same thing. <laughs> I totally copied her. And yeah, cause we were in the process of setting up our yeah, shed we- <laughs> as well when you were doing that. And I was, I was so jealous. I was like, she's got this whole, this whole indoor space to process milk when it it's, comes in. Yeah. And that's- it makes it so much cleaner. You know, for a long time, I just milked on a milk stand in the barn aisle, but it was dusty and there was flies mm. and I never sold milk then because I didn't feel like I had a controlled environment and right. to do that. Yeah. Now my shed has electricity and I'm able to use my yeah. milk machine and everything's contained. But I'm milking, you know, 15 to 20 goats at a time. I really need that kind of infrastructure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you have a small homestead and you just want two to three animals to give your family, you know, dairy or whatever, you have pets and you're milking for show, there's, you know, there's different reasons. A small a milking stand is you have to have one, basically. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. not an option to not have one, in my opinion. You need it yeah. for trimming hooves. You need it for milking. You yeah. need it for if you need to look at the animal for any reason. Yeah. A milk stand is vital. Mm-hmm. We made ours out of pallets. Mm-hmm. I was going to say, you, you can, can do it very You do not have to go out and spend $600 on a milk stand. You, Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. Some of them get very pricey. Okay. And they're very nice. Mm-hmm. But, but our pallet <laughs> ones work just fine. Right. <laughs> Not necessary. I think we have maybe $10 of supplies in them because, you know, the right. pallets were free and I had used stall mats already. So we cut those to fit on them. And then I think it's just hardware and then a couple of extra things that we added on to make our milk stands. And because we want them to be reinforced. Pallets are often yeah. quite flimsy. So, we, you know, we had good pallets yeah. with good quality wood, but you can do it very cheaply. Okay. Um so milk stand, milk stand, covered space, covered space, very important. You know that. Well, hookahs, yeah, because I mean you're going to have to milk no matter what the weather, right? And you <laughs> in don't, the rain. You don't want to be doing it in the rain. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Goodness knows I learned that the hard way. Um, the those hoop houses, you can split them in half. You know, if you have four cattle panels bent over to make a long tube. You can have a panel in the middle with a gate on it, you know, like a little walkthrough gate Mm -hmm. and have your milking stand on one side of that. So you're still covered and the goat's house is right on the other side. So you just easily lead them through. It can be very simple and very practical. It's very portable. Um, 
You're going to want to make sure that you have something to put your milking supplies on, though. Don't set them on the ground. That's where there's going to be more bacteria, risk of listeria and E. coli, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. I don't play around with that kind of stuff. I'm very particular about milk handling just because I'm doing this for my family to be healthy. I don't yeah. want to make everyone sick. Right, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, if you are buying raw milk from somebody, it doesn't hurt to see their milking area and how they handle it because yeah, it's, it can you know, be a big deal. It can be mm-hmm. a big deal. And so I use a chlorhexidine wash pre-wash the udder with that. I take a cooler out with hot water and washcloths that, you know, I do bleach those. I try not to use bleach, but I will bleach the heck out of my milking oh, yeah. cloths. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so the clean cloths in hot water with a little bit of dish soap. I learned that one from Donna. <laughs> Works great. <laughs> and then I use a chlorhexidine wash. You can buy chlorhexidine by the gallon from the feed store for like $12 um, and mix your own udder wash solution. It's very effective. Um, so is that like a concentrate that you're getting? Yeah, you yeah. get it in the yeah. you mix it in. A, I mix it in a big right. spray so bottle. So it probably lasts forever, a long forever. time. Forever. Yeah, you. It's so like it's a, worth the twelve dollars. Oh, it's for like a sure. Half a teaspoon for my spray bottle, mm-hmm. and I. I mean, I use probably a little more. I do I too. Don't measure it, but I probably yeah, do a tablespoon. It but it's a big quart size spray bottle. Right. Um, and then I spray the udder down. I wipe it. I spray it again. I wipe it again. Make sure the tea orifices are clean. Then, you know, you want to make sure your hands are clean. Wearing gloves is not a bad idea, but it's, I always felt like it was kind of wasteful. Mm -hmm. So I just wash my hands really well. Yeah. I monitor the somatic cell counts. You know, that's the kind of gives you an idea of where the bacteria levels are in the udder through milk testing. Um, Okay. And so I've, in doing that, I'm very comfortable with using my bare hands because I'm, you know, I wash them and then when we milk. Um, if you are in a place maybe out where it's a little dirtier and you don't have access to a sink to wash your hands, taking sterile gloves and using those is not a bad idea. Mm -hmm. Um, milk into a sterile bucket, keep it covered, keep the flies out of it. Um, and then teat dip afterwards. You know, if you can use the spray to make sure that it's really getting in the orifice, that's fine. But I do find that teat dips afterwards tend to be a little bit more effective. Um, I used to use iodine, and then my skin started reacting to the iodine. You know, oh. I would get a rash anytime iodine touched my skin oh, no. from overusing it. And so now I just stick with the chlorhexidine and have not had any issues at all with so it. So what kind of teat dip do you recommend then afterwards? Because um, our new cow has very dry teats, and I know iodine is super drying, and that's not helping her. So I'm look, I'm on, I'm shopping. I do chlorhexidine, and I will oh, add just it. a little bit of vegetable glycerin to it, and that really helps stop it from drying out their skin. Mm-hmm. Um, and just use that afterwards, and that has been totally fine for me. I don't have issues with staff. I don't have, you know, you, they can get those little staff bumps on them. I use it for the cows too, and I don't have any issues with it. Okay, good to know. I use fresh teat dip every time, though. I think that that's important to say. You can't set it on the shelf and use it again the next right, day and expect it to solution. be sanitary, yeah. right? You know, you got to use fresh every day. Right. Yeah. No double dipping. No double dipping. <laughs> <laughs> right. So then, do you um, you you uh, use a milk machine? Yes, I hand milk a lot too, but I okay. do use a, pr- a milk machine predominantly when, especially if I'm milking twenty goats at a time, my oh, hands gosh. would fall off. <laughs> yes. Right. Um, yes. And so that, I really like the enclosed system. I like that it keeps the milk extra sanitary. There's not hair in it. I do use a strainer afterwards with disposable milk filters. I feel like that's important to really make sure that everything is where it should be. Um, But I really enjoy the machine. (laughs) Yeah. It's it's worth the investment. How long does that take you to milk 20 goats? I can milk 20 goats in about an hour. Wow. With the machine. With the machine. That's impressive. Because I have two milk stands set up, so I will clean the goats, hook them up, run back out, get two more. I tie them right outside the milk room, come in, pull the milk machine off, strip, sanitize, put those two out. You know, it's like an assembly line. Right. And they all know, they all behave themselves and like- Oh, they line up at the gate. Don't kick off inflations when you run out and- Some of them (laughs) will. The first fresheners tend to be a little more funny about it, especially if they're older. My yearlings, they, they- learn super fast. They line up and they're fine. But recently I got a doe that was four as a first freshener. That did not go well. She is <laughs> not. She's absolutely, you know, I pulled her kids and milked her twice a day for six months 
And at the end of the six months, it was like day one. It was the biggest struggle I have ever had. I have never she had that kind of She just didn't want issues. to do it. She did not want to do it. Yeah, and that's funny. Bye-bye. She did much better <laughs> hand milking than she did with the machine. And if I didn't really love this goat and her genetics, she would have been bye-bye. She gets one more pass <laughs> because right, right. I really want those genetics. But if if it's this kind of struggle again, right. then it will be bye-bye because yeah. I don't have time for that. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. Um, what about... Like what, what are some things that people should have on hand as far as, or like, what do they do? You know, I'm on several homestead pages, you know, on through social media. And so there's a lot of, um, I went out and this animal, whatever animal is down. Um, a lot of times it's goats. Like what are some things that people should have on hand to, um, try and diagnose a situation and then treat a situation, um, that emergency care stuff that you can't always run and call a vet for. Right. Well, I will say having an established relationship with a vet is important. It's vital. It's vital for any, if you're going to have any kind of livestock, I know that that's not always an option in certain areas. A lot of vets don't want to treat goats. They don't know anything about goats. Some vets give terrible advice about goats. Mm. We are really lucky that we have an excellent vet. We have a couple of really good vets in the area that will see goats. And I love my vet. And I, you know, it's such a peace of mind to know that if I needed something like a C-section or an emergency mastectomy, because we did that recently, (laughs) um, (laughs) that I have such a good vet and I already have the established relationship. Don't wait for an emergency to find a vet because most vets won't see you if you're not an established client, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Uh, And your goat's just going to die. Yeah. Right. Um, for things that you don't have time or there's not a goat, you know, a, a goat vet in your area, there's things to have on hand, uh, you know, second to a vet or sometimes even better than a vet is a really, really seasoned breeder mm. that knows what they're doing, that has seen it all before and is willing to help you. You know, people find a mentor. And if you, if someone is mentoring you, I, you know, I kind of touched on this the last time we talked, don't waste their time. Like, yeah. if you are taking up someone's time and they're giving you advice, you know, you don't have to take all the advice, but at least try it. <laughs> like, right. don't right. waste their time. Try to compensate them for their time. And you know, because having that mentor there when an emergency hits is invaluable. Yeah. Having somebody to show you in person how to disbud your goats if you choose to disbud, very important. I learned from watching YouTube and... I wouldn't recommend wow. that. I do not recommend that. That is you know, brave. We got through it, but it's much easier if you have someone to show you in person. Right. Yeah. Um, the So vet and mentor, top yeah. two biggest things for success if you want to raise goats. Yeah. Very, Commu- very important. Community is so important. So in, important. In, in homesteading and having farm animals. Yes. Mm-hmm. It is super important. And I bounce stuff off of other breeders that I'm friends with all the time. Like, hey, how did you treat this? Or, you mm. know, like. Right. What do you think about this? Right. Even if they're not local to you, Facebook is really good because you can, it, you can network with so many people. And there's a lot of really helpful groups about goats on Facebook. There's one group that some people aren't crazy about, but I have found extremely invaluable as far as the accuracy of the information and their willingness to help out in emergencies and their understanding that not everyone can afford or access a vet is the successful goading with Rosie group. Mm -hmm. Love that group. Very helpful. If you want to get goats, join that group first. Mm -hmm. Don't panic. There's a lot Mm -hmm. of sick goat posts, but that's because people post when they have an emergency. They're not posting when everything is going great and dandy. Right. right. So keep that in mind. Don't panic. But that group is one that I would join and read and read and read Mm -hmm. to decide if you even want to get goats. Because once you get the goats, that's not really the time to decide you don't want the goats. Right. (laughs) Sometimes you can't know until you get them that you don't want them. But... I feel like going in armed with as much information as possible is really going to help you with success. And they have lists. There's multiple groups that have lists, but that has charts for medication you should have on hand, dewormers, nice. antibiotics, the dosage per weight. Like they have all of that already written out for you. So there's no guessing. Yeah. That's when you have an emergency, having a chart that you can print out and say, okay, penicillin is typically one cc per 20 pounds twice a day for goats. Right. Instead or, of having to Google it right. and get 27 different answers. Filter right. through the information. And talk to a vet who doesn't know how to treat goats, who gives you the improper dosage, because I've had that happen before. Mm. You know, that it's 
It's very helpful. Or like, is it safe for a pregnant mama? Right. You know, or some vets have no idea. There's right. dewormers you cannot use for pregnant, mm-hmm. you know, right. pregnant animals in general. And so these, that group specifically has the best charts in my opinion. Yeah. I use those charts actually for my sheep from that, that same yeah. group. And I have used it as a base for the cows and have run them by both of our good local vets whom we use. And they've both said, yes, that's yes. absolutely correct. And everything in that group has been backed up when I've talked to the vets about it. Nice. Mm-hmm. So we will make sure to put a link. Yeah. Yes. yes. That would be very helpful yeah. for people. We'll I put really a link do in appreciate the description. that group. Yeah. That way, um, if any of y'all want to access that group, um, it's very helpful. You know where to find it. And then even like your minerals that you were using and suggesting, you know, maybe we can throw up a link to that too. Yeah, yeah I, I could do to that. Ask, how, where do you source your minerals from? The I get the Vita Firm from a local feed mill in our area, but mm-hmm. you can look it up. You can look up distributors for the Vita Firm Conceptaid on their website. Mm-hmm. Um, Sweet Licks Meat Maker, a lot of farm stores sell that. A lot of feed stores sell that. Um, those two are probably the best ones. Vitafirm actually makes a goat mineral too. It's called Durafirm, but I feel like it's not quite what my goats needed for this area. Right. People love to tell you, look for a mineral that's designed for your area. Well, do you think that there's really that many goat minerals out there? Do you think that people put that much effort? No, that's not helpful advice. (laughs) You're going to have to trial and error, see how your goats look. Do they look like they need more zinc? Do they look like they need more copper? A lot of people pour the copper to them when they're actually zinc deficient and that creates an issue. So Having that buffet-style mineral thing out there has taken a lot of the guesswork out of it for me because they just dose themselves. They know what they need. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so good minerals, good feed, a relationship with a mentor, good fencing. Yeah. Um, (laughs) And then for an emergency kit, you know, now everything is prescription only as far as antibiotics goes. So I hope y'all stocked up on that. Establish that that vet relationship. Establish (laughs) the vet relationship because you're going to need it if you need to get antibiotics. Yep. The having things like penicillin G with procaine, that's the long acting. You need the long acting for goats. Their metabolisms are too fast. You cannot use the regular penicillin. So having that on hand, that works for a lot of things. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people underdose it and you have to give it twice a day because their metabolisms are so fast. You know, I'm not found it to be the fact that penicillin doesn't work anymore. I think it's people are misusing it. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, Keep that on hand. Uh, oxytetracycline, which is biomycin or LA-200. I like the biomycin because it doesn't sting. It has an anesthetic agent in it like the penicillin does. Mm -hmm. Um, Keeping those two on hand, that's very effective for things like chlamydia. If your goats happen to get that, if you, you know, got it from an auction or picked it up, you know, from flies Flies, at a show or, you know, it can, you can get it anywhere. It sounds super scary, but the oxytetracycline works great. Works great for pink eye. Works great for mastitis. It's These are really two of the best antibiotics to keep on hand for general use. Mm-hmm. Um, what about pain meds? It Again, you're going to need a vet. Right. Banamine is a really excellent anti-inflammatory. Kind of gets them a little drunk, which sometimes is, you know, you want that. You want them to be a little woo- woozy Chills sometimes. Chills bit. them out a little yeah. bit. That's a really, really good one to keep on hand. If you don't have access to it, you can use Motrin. Mm-hmm. Ibuprofen is fine for goats. Um, I think they can have aspirin too. Like children's Motrin or like tablets? You can or? use tablets, but okay. I've used the children's Motrin because it's easier. easier. Like liquid. Yeah. You liquid. And, and you just them. Yes. Them. Okay. Okay. For your emergency kit, please get a drenching syringe with a there metal tip. There you go. Please have that before your goats get sick because mm-hmm. I have so many people message me and they're like, well, how do I give them the medicine? Well, you have to you drench, drench them, them with it. <laughs> well, all I have is this three milliliter syringe. That's not going to work. They're Go going to eat it. <laughs> a, my favorite is the 30 milliliter drenching syringe. It's yellow at tractor supply with a metal tip. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Get it. Get three of them because you're going to lose it. Yeah. yeah. Clean it out afterwards so it's not funky and yeah. plugged up when you need it. Keep them clean. Please. That is like a vital thing for your emergency kit. Yeah. We use that a lot, actually. Yeah. We, for all girls, the time. Too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so drenching syringe. The antibiotics, banamine or Motrin works really well. Um, let me see what I got here. The needles and syringes. Right. Yeah. Keep them on hand. 18 gauge, 20 gauge needles, three milliliter, six milliliter, 12 milliliter syringes. I have, I'm like a vet supply store right now with, <laughs> with all the stuff <laughs> I stocked up on because you never know when you're going to need it. Right. And I have 
you know, had the opportunity to help people who were having an emergency that the vet couldn't get to them in time. And, you know, that, that six, 12 hours before the vet can get right. there, that, that's an important time that slot. Can be life and so time. I just like to have everything on hand. I like to be prepared. Um, I keep things like charcoal, activated charcoal on hand because oh, if there's any poisoning, you know, if there's any suspicion of that, that's the first thing you give them. Charcoal, milk of magnesia, because that's going to give them diarrhea, but it's going to pass that stuff through without them absorbing as much of it. Right. I never um, thought about that. Yeah. Milk of magnesia is excellent if you think there's poisoning that's happened. Okay. Um, what else? Spectaguard, which is, again, you're going to need a prescription now, but if you are if you have an animal with bowel distress, diarrhea, that kind of thing, you, if it's bacteria-related, that has been the best thing I've found. It works for E. coli. Um, my goat kids got campylobacter from my neighbor's auction steer that was a whole issue a couple of years ago and the combination of antibiotics with the spectaguard orally is what saved the ones that didn't die wow um the what else what about like um parasite wormers get a microscope Mm -hmm. because vets don't have time or will charge a lot of money to run fecals now. I think I saw somebody quote that it was like $45 per sample to have a vet run fecals. Get a microscope. <laughs> there is, here's another Facebook page for you to link. <laughs> okay. Animal fecal microscopy. Oh, cool. Yeah. They do all kinds of animals. They teach you how to run your fecals. Wow. You can buy a whole kit for fecal testing your animals with a guide and a microscope for like $250. Right. Get the microscope. It is worth the investment. Yeah. That's, it's been the best tool. My kids learn a lot from it. You know, they love looking at that kind of stuff. That is super important tool because then you know what the parasite is. Right. And how to treat it. How to treat it. And then you can test again. Exactly. You test again to see if your treatment is working. Right. So, okay, ivermectin still works at my farm. A lot of people say it doesn't work anymore on barber pole worms, Mm -hmm. which is the one that is very commonly killing goats. Well, I know from running fecals that it still works at my farm. If I dose with ivermectin, it kills over 90% of the worms on the slide. So I use that. Until it doesn't work anymore because mm-hmm. I don't want the resistance issues. Right. right. And the current recommendation, I have another website for you. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> the uh, um, American Consortium for Small Ruminants. Okay. It's, I think the website is like worm info, wormx.info, we'll find something it like we'll, that. We'll yeah, it's the Consortium for Small Ruminants. Okay. okay. They have all the studies on. Things that have, you know, they've experimented with to see if it works for small ruminants. Things like pine bark is an excellent thing to prevent parasites because of the condensed tannins in it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Things like the copper oxide wire particles. You know, they have all the scientific studies to back this up. Orange oil, mm-hmm. that works for parasites as well, specifically the barber pole worms. So that has a lot of really good, helpful information as far as learning about parasite prevention instead of just treatments. That's um, cool. I think the current recommendation is to use two or three wormers from different classes at the same time. So that would be like yeah. a white dewormer with the ivermectin, like Safeguard or Valbazin. But you can't use Valbazin on pregnant animals, right. so you better have a plan. <laughs> right. um, all of the, all of those are listed on that successful goat. Goating, yes, she has the dosages yeah. and how to use all of those things. Right. I. Really that have Facebook that page. Facebook yeah. page. It's, it, had, they make it simple. They make it so simple and tangible. There are files where you can just go in and download all these charts and print them out and keep them in your shed. Like mm-hmm. it, keep it in your emergency mm-hmm. kit. They have yeah. the doses for everything. And it's, I have not found anything that was not dosed accurately mm-hmm. on those charts. They're the most up-to-date information. I have benefited from that group so much. Um, and it's free. They, it's these people free, are spending, right. they're answering questions. They're spending hours to help people because they want them to be successful right. and it's free. So people can say what they want, but <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. Really, I mean, that, that has a lot of value, yes. a lot of value. And just keeping stuff like the charcoal on hand, mm-hmm. you might not think about that, but they do discuss that in that group in the milk of magnesia. Mm-hmm. The, if you can find it, keeping the 
um, clostridium antitoxin, mm -hmm. the C and D antitoxin on hand. It's not the toxoid that's the vaccine, the antitoxin on hand. Because if they do you get clostridium, you want to have that on hand already. You can't wait to order it online and have it come in in you know three days. Right. You'll have dead goats. Your goat will be dead yeah. by then. Yeah. Um, and just put eyes on your goats every day, twice a day. You don't have to like do a full body check on everybody, but if you know their personalities, you're going to know that something is off, that you're going to know that, okay, this person's usually really pushy and they're kind of standing off today. Let me take their temperature. Right. The taking, that's another one, two <laughs> thermometers. You two. need two good <laughs> thermometers in your emergency kit right. because inevitably if you have one, when you need it, the battery is going to be dead <laughs> right. or your kid will have carried it off. Right. Like, you, you know, keep two. Uh -huh. I really, really like the Vicks Vapor Rub thermometers. They're like $14 at Walmart, but they are fast and they are accurate. And I have, I think, eight of them somewhere, like <laughs> somewhere. all over because <laughs> here and there. Because <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I have to write like human or goat on them so yeah. they don't oh, get yeah. class Ooh, contaminated. Yeah. Make, sure, make sure it's marked appropriately but for sure. Thermometers, very important because the first thing the vet or your mentor is going to ask when you tell them your goat is sick is, What's the rectal temperature? Yeah. And that's the first thing the, vote, the vet does when they come. Is, is take a temperature yeah. because you have to have that information. Does the animal have a fever? Do they have a low body temperature? Because low body temperature could indicate um, hypocalcemia, low calcium. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The high fever, you know, could it be poisoning? Could it be, you know, pneumonia? Pneumonia can be very aggressive and out of nowhere. Mastitis, they're going to have a fever usually. Right. Um. That's your. That's a really valuable tool, and you. It's very inexpensive. Very, Get yeah, at least right. two. Yeah, right. Very easy first step. Um, I think. I think that's a good last word. Honestly, I mean, just to know your animals. Know your animals. See them regularly. Um, Don't wait till they're flat out on the ground screaming in pain to call someone for help. Like, right. act when you notice something is off because you can't just dismiss it as oh they'll get over it because they are prey animals they're going to hide when they're sick so when you notice they're sick they've already been sick for a little while yeah act the minute you notice something is wrong take their temperature check their famacha score which is the right color of the eye membranes or right. parasite that you know indicates anemia run a fecal all of these things yes they are investments up front but if you want to be successful and you want to have low stress yeah that's what you got to do well, and just know that if you're going to have these animals, you're going to be spending money. Yeah, there's yeah. no getting I mean, around it. Yeah, the animal is actually the cheapest investment yes. in this whole deal. <laughs> if yeah. you are trying to do this to save money, don't. No. Buy milk from somebody else. Yep. Because <laughs> you're not going to save money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, I'm Saturn. sure we could keep going. I could definitely keep, keep going. going but I know. I know. For time's sake. I know. Ask, ask a goat breeder to talk about goats. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ask we'll do that. it all day. But hey, we can always do a part three. We could. <laughs> I'm sure we'll have her back one day for something. Yep. All right. I think that's good, right? It was good, y'all. Thank you yeah, so thanks much. Thanks for having me Emily. back. Y'all go you. check out um, Bridge Acres. Bridge Acre Farms. Bridge Acres. Bridge Acres Farms. Um, she's on Instagram and Facebook and her website. She is a reputable breeder. And um, you can see all her pretty little there. <laughs> yeah. Yep. All right. All right. Thanks. All right, thanks. Bye. Bye.